third uh, meeting of the Auburn School Committee. We are coming to you through Zoom this evening. Uh, you can, the meeting's recorded and made available by Great Falls TV, um, which you can access through the, uh, excuse me, auburnmain.gov uh, website or on Spectrum Channel 1301 and on the city's YouTube channel. So let's begin with a call to order and introductions in ward order, please. I am Rose Walker from Ward 1. Pam Hart, Ward 2. Oh, and you're back, Pam. Karen Matthew, Ward 3. Brian Belknap, Ward 4. Dan Poisson, Ward 5. Faith Fontaine at large. Brian Kier, Mayor's representative. <laughs> And I didn't notice if Mr. Simpson had clicked on yet. And the, the view has changed, so I'm not sure if he pops no, on. He, he has not come in yet. Oh, he's not come in yet. Okay. All right. Let's begin uh, next on the item, uh, communications. Does anyone have any communications they'd like to share this evening? Give a second in case anyone needs to un unmute. All right. Question. I have a question that actually was brought up. Um, the retirement, um, what we were talking about, um, you know, providing retirement and you needed five people or three people, I can't remember now, to mm -hmm. do that in order to save money. Um, was it only asked of people that were 65 or people that are older than 65? Can they um, take advantage of that as well? Was that a communication that you got, a, a question you got from a constituent? Yes. It was for anyone who qualifies 62 or older. Or older. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Thank you. All right. Any other communications? Uh, one, Karen. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Faith. No, go ahead, Faith. I'll do that. No, I'm not ready. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Um, I was going to return the, uh, the technology subcommittee meeting or update as well, but I can do it now. Um, so I've heard from a few parents, a few teachers. Um, I've actually had some uh, experience with it as of recently for the last couple of weeks. Um, around the, the use of IXL and the benefits of it and why we moved away from it and moving towards more like the Moby Max and that kind of piece. Um, you know, my girls have loved it. They've been using it, like I said, in addition to what they've been doing for their work and they get up every morning and they use it and it's, and my wife loves it. And, and like I said, various people in my neighborhood have also been using it and um, have done their own subscription for it. So I'm just curious why we decided to, I'm assuming it must be the subscription and the cost of, of, of it maybe, or maybe it's not, but something I think we should look at revisiting. Okay. Uh, so maybe. Do, yeah. It, we did not tell people they couldn't have IXL. Okay. It, it, it came down to, um, you know, it's always a yin and a yang, right? There are people who like IXL and then there are people like Moby Max and then there's people who like whichever. And, um, so we talked about, I think there were some schools that were going to keep supporting IXL in their budget and district the, at the district level, they were doing, um, we looked at Moby Max cause there were teachers who liked mm -hmm. Moby Max. So it was trying to, uh, we were noticing teachers weren't using IXL as much. There were some obviously that, that did. And so that that's what happens is usage and then people picking up on it. So if there's teachers that are concerned and have talked to their administrator and yeah, that's kind of, um, that's kind of what I've told them is I said, you know, yeah. I, I said, I'll, I'll certainly raise it, but I said, yeah. you know, the parents should raise it to the teachers, teachers raise it yeah. to their administrators. And, and certainly as that, you know, if, it, if, yeah. if it certainly needs more awareness then great. Um, but um, you know, like I said, I just, I've seen the benefits just over the last couple of weeks uh, specifically. Oh, yeah. And uh, so just thought I'd raise it as a, as a communication. Sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, I think if it came from Fairview at all, I know Celeste has talked about IXL. Yeah. Of course that's where it generated. Cause that's where my girls are. Officially, right. but, yeah. And she uh, brought that up. She brought that up. That her teachers still like IXL. Yes. Perfect. I mean, there are teachers across the district that like IXL. They like Moby Max. They like different things. So, and I think Stephanie is coming on to the meeting. So, um, she was there. Yeah. So she can, also yeah, it'd, yeah, it'd be good. Cause I think, uh, I think when my wife was looking at potentially what to just continue moving on with throughout the summer, just to keep the girls current all the way, it was kind of, that was kind of the recommendation over Moby Max right. from at least their teachers. Um, but again, I think yeah. it's, 
certainly something we should look at, um, yeah. you know, and look at both Movie Max and IXL and, and figure out, you know, going forward, something, something good for, and I can raise it with the, with Peter as well, just to kind of, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I just jump in for a second? Yeah, of course. Um, So (laughs) I know, I know. So, uh, we, we did make a switch to Moby Max for the current school year because of what you said, Brian, there were some opportunities cost wise for it to be um, provided district wide. And, um, before when we were using IXL, we were using it just for math and Moby Max allowed us to get access to math, ELA science and social studies. So we opted to try it. Um, and right now I have a survey out to teachers in the district asking them for input on three different platforms, IXL, MobyMax, and Freckle. And we um, are going to take all of that data and we're going to look at the factors that we have to consider when we make a choice for a district-provided platform. And we'll land on one of those three. And as Katie said, if buildings chose beyond that to support something in addition, then they could always do that. Well, that's that's great to hear. I've I've actually used all three um, over the last <laughs> several months, so uh, uh, it's good that we're looking at and uh, uh, having the teachers weigh in and, and and go with one platform. I think that makes sense. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you, Shelley and um, and Brian and Katie for that one. Uh, Faith, did you have a communication you wanted to share? Yes. So I was um, Christy Keep the gym teacher at AMS shared with me that she applied for a focus grant through Outride and they have provided 51 bicycles for AMS um, free through a grant and they are being assembled locally by Busy Town Bikes in Lewiston. They are on our insurance and I'm not sure how the school will utilize them, but I just think it will be an awesome outlet, especially if we'll be doing any outdoor learning. Um, I just think it's a great thing for the kids at AMS for getting them going and Um, it's a great thing. 51 bikes for free and we're supporting a local business too. So just wanted to share that. Go Christy. Thank you, Faith. Absolutely. Um, so for, uh, just for transparency, Dave Simpson is having difficulty trying to log on. He has texted me and I think Pam as well. Is that him? Yeah. He's trying again. He's trying again. Okay. I think he has to download it. I had to download the zoom on my computer for some reason. I've never had to do that. Well, they've upgraded. They've they've upgraded. Okay. So that's why we'll let him keep. Okay. We'll let him keep trying and see if he can um, see. Hopefully he'll be able to, to, uh, I am not Brian Belknap. I don't know these things. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, We just, we just went through this whole thing at at work that uh, they, they had pushed out a huge upgrade and yeah, uh, as, of, as of June 1st, <laughs> if you were using the old one, you were no longer going to be using the old one. They absolutely they cut it off right away. So, okay. It's Any other communications? Dave, Oops, yeah. sorry. It is showing that Dave has mic and video. It's showing on my, there he comes. Here he comes. Okay. okay. All right. So while he's joining us, any other communications this evening? No, he went out again. Uh, bummer. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, we heard your voice. Good. All right. I'm going to move on. Let's move on to the next section, the consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda, which is uh, uh, approval of tonight's agenda, along with the approval of the minutes from the May 20th meeting, as well as certificated nominations. Can I entertain a motion, please? Oh, I heard Brian Carrier first. Can I get a second? second? Brian second. Belknap, second. All those in favor. And because I can't see you, I'll have to do roll call. Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. Ward three is a yes. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. Uh, Faith Fontaine at large? Yes. Uh, don't know if Dave Simpson's with us. Yes. Dave, are you with yes. us yet? Yes. I vote okay. yes. Okay. Thank you. And Brian Carrier? Yes. All right. Motion passes. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have public participation. Uh, public participation is being done again through call in. The uh, phone number is on the agenda, um, as as well as um, hopefully at the bottom streaming, 207-240-3739. And just as a reminder, if you're not able to call in or your call's not received um, on other topics that are um, not on the agenda this evening, please feel free to reach out to one of your school committee uh, representatives. Our our, um, emails are listed on the agenda, as well as on the um, school website.
there it is. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, student information, I did not invite the um, our students to come this evening. Uh, next up, superintendent reports. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna, just to say about student information, when you come in, um, as uh, Adam will share when we get to the recommended school budget, mm -hmm. uh, when a uh, students serve as school committee members, they do get a $250 scholarship from us. Um, uh, for each year they serve. So Anna look, um, LeBlanc is going to get her um, $250 for serving this year. So when you come in to sign, I've already written a card. And the, so the card will be next to where you sign. So just add your signature to the card. And okay. then when um, you've been in and you've signed, I'll make sure we send the card with her check. So, um, okay. That, Thank you. I just want to yeah. know. So the first yeah. one, so I'll go to stop sharing the screen, is the COVID-19 um, uh, update. And so you can see there's a lot of people on tonight because there's a lot of people doing work behind the scenes. And I, you know, I do want to assure people who are watching, we, we know there's a lot of an an anxiousness and um, anxiety around what is the fall going to look like. Uh, and absolutely, we're, we are starting to focus on that uh, but we also been focusing on things that are coming up like june 8th through the 12th when staff um, may be accessing the building and our summer programming so michelle uh, mcclellan and shelly mogul have been facilitating a group of stakeholders and many of them are on the call um, uh, the zoom meeting tonight to share um, information and um, so i'm going to turn it over to michelle and uh, shelly who are going to organize this evening's uh, report out on information If you'll allow screen sharing, Katie, I, I will. just did it. Yay. Awesome. Okay. So as Katie has explained, um, at some point in, in May, Shelly and I having conversations really could see clearly we were, we were going to need uh, some sort of collective thinking uh, in order to address many issues that we knew were going to loom around re-entry. And uh, we have been waiting and uh, for, for many different, as you all know, many different um, points along the journey from March for the DOE to provide with specific guidelines. And, and uh, that we learned somewhat quickly that that was not going to be as specific maybe as we needed and in the times that, that we needed them. So um, we started to do some research uh, internationally, nationally, and really felt like it was time to pull together a, a committee. And um, so we did that. So we're going to talk about that tonight, give you an update about that committee's work. We've met three times, um, what the purpose is, who they are, and um, then the work to date. So. Without further ado, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, purpose and membership. Uh, the purpose of this committee is to develop, implement, and monitor safe and effective plans for students and staff to re enter the schools and to resume learning. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the membership is diverse and growing, I will say. Uh, first meeting had a a group of people and it's been growing ever since every meeting uh, we're on our third meeting and um, I anticipate that the membership will continue to shift as we go so you can see the membership there teachers um, nurse our school health I don't know if to call him this school physician anymore because he's a nurse practitioner just uh, agreed to join as of today uh, school administrators program directors in the district we have a parent who happens to be a doctor. That that helps considerably. Uh, Dr. Bowsman has been um, a wonderful asset and resource resource to us. Uh, Karen has joined uh, from the school committee and district administrators, as well as uh, Deputy Chief Fifield from the city. Another 
a great resource for us as we've been able to align some of our practices with the city. Uh, so we've developed some filters in doing some of the research um, for the work that we are doing moving forward. And these filters are going to um, constantly kind of guiding uh, the, the work that we're doing and how we are thinking about moving forward. So certainly safety and operations, uh, the learning, how's, uh, what's going to be uh, needed in terms of consideration around learning for students and for adults. Uh, well-being and protections. So thinking about the whole individual, staff, students, um, and protections is really kind of thinking about those groups and individuals who may be not a general population, but in um, more subgroups um, or marginalized populations within our demographics. So being mindful of the whole and being mindful of the individual needs and of, of certain groups and students and staff. And then of course, communication, looking at that communication of a uh, certainly making sure that people have what they need in terms of information to uh, be involved in uh, learning and uh, the reentry, but also getting communication in more of a feedback loop a continuous cycle of communication where we're reaching out to the community and to uh, staff and students and asking for their feedback as well. So those are the filters we're using to guide uh, the work within the committee. Uh, so going down a little bit more, we get a broad idea of what this group is about. Uh, right now we're in, involved in focusing the work and the, the work when we first thought about re-entry, I think it was a natural inclination to think about the fall. And we were all thinking about the fall and what's going to happen and how are we, how's this going to look and what are the considerations we need to make in terms of developing a plan. And as we started the conversation, um, it became clear that there were some uh, markers before that that we, we needed to consider, summer programs. So we started to talk about summer programs and we had some guidelines that came out simultaneously from the DOE at that time that brought our eye there. So um, that was a little more immediate. And then we had the realization of, well, we actually have people entering our building on June 8th, potentially. And that's the teachers. That's the staff coming back in for those um, end of the year activities that we have Uh both closing out this year, planning activities for next year, as well as professional development. I mean, this has been an unusual year, no, no doubt about it. So closure activities uh, have a certain look to them this year that they haven't had in the past. Uh, so it was important to think about what was going to need to be in place to assure, again, thinking of those filters, safety and operations, well-being, and protections particularly, what learning needed to take place um, in order for those two filters um, to be actualized. And then of course, uh, communicating around that. So again, using those filters, this has really allowed us to, in a small way, in a contained way, kind of trial run our thinking about bigger steps in the re-entry. We know that there are going to be much, many more variables to consider in considering back to school. But this allowed us to start practicing and, and using some tools to help us break down and think about what are the important and essential um, variables that we need to consider in having people come back into our school. Um, so, oh yes, Shelly helped me with. So where are we in the work? Right now the committee spent today, this morning, looking at the plans for next, starting next Monday. And that work has been um, completed on the committee's end. Now it's handed off to the building. And we're going to have some folks here in a minute that are going to explain some of that to you. Uh, but the committee has, has um, kind of finished out their, their work in that area. Summer programs, where are we? Well, that's the work in progress. 
we started having those conversations, um, putting procedures into place. What do we need to consider? And we'll continue to do that um, as we move forward for child care, for this summer rec program that the city will be house, um, hosting at some of our schools, uh, the feeding program, which will continue through the summer, and then some remote aspects of the summer program for special education. And CLC, actually, Community Learning Center, is doing some fabulous work with um, some STEM activities for students to do over the summer at home. They've sent home packages uh, of materials and, and we'll be checking in along the way uh, remotely with their students. So very exciting. And then we'll continue the coming soon uh, back to school using those city and state guide, the guidance that we received them for them, as well as looking out beyond. Just before I came on tonight, I was re-looking at a document from uh, North Dakota and that their uh, Department of Education put out and was re-looking at that again to see where we were at against where they're at. So uh, continuing to, to use those guidances to, as we get ready to talk about um, the fall. So questions on anything so far on that before we move into the next stage of this? What did you learn about North Dakota and what they were doing? Um, well, like I looked where, at the, where are they at in comparison? Yeah, well, they, they didn't fully close. Okay. They did not fully close. They're a more, they have more rural areas, rural schools than we do. And so they had different guidelines that they were using um, to determine whether they were closing or not. So big cities like Fargo, they were in full closure, much like us. Um, but so what I learned, what I learned is it's a minutia. I mean, it's a step-by-step -step plan, all the considerations. So I'm looking at all those considerations that they have um, to think about. Think about this little thing and what does social distancing look like and what do hallways look like and what do cafeterias look like? So it's good to expand our thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just want to emphasize that I'm, you know, glad and I hope we continue to look at all aspects. Um, I will be the first to admit that homeschooling is not for me and having a career and two people in the home that work and three kids in school, it is not easy. So, you know, I'm just going to emphasize even more that we just look at all different things because I can't imagine, you know, people that don't have the means or, I, I can't imagine how difficult it must be for other families because I've found it very, very difficult too. And I just, we need, and kids that, you know, school is their safe zone. I think that's the biggest thing that I've struggled with. But there's kids that they're only safe when they're in school. And so I just want to emphasize that we look at all the different aspects, which I know you guys are, but just that we can do everything we can to get kids back into school safely. I mean, I don't want to have. That's one of the reasons, Faith. It's a very you know, it, it's an important reason to consider what, the, all those things that you just talked about. Very important. And of course, the number one is we believe that students are going to learn best. If Absolutely. You're my teacher, my you're kids will learn teacher. better in the classroom than at home. Mm -hmm. I'll be the first to do that. But. Michelle, I think you made a really good point this morning in the meeting, um, thinking about that there are a lot of um, families who are along the, you know, a continuum of beliefs. And so how we honor everyone's belief around what is going on right now. Uh, you know, we, uh, I think this committee fully understands that we will have some families who will be rolling up on two wheels, um, barely slowing down to five miles an hour and asking their children to tuck and roll on that first day of school as they drop them off. And then we understand that there will be families on the other end of the spectrum who just cannot, um, cannot access our buildings um, in the public, you know, our brick and mortar buildings. So I think this is really important. Um, it's really important to make sure that you know, some, no matter where you are along this continuum as the work and the planning, um, we want to honor where everyone is at the, and, and Michelle was, was careful to bring that up this morning too. So, um, and just for the record, I will be the parent rolling in hot on two wheels. So, and I think faith will be right ahead of me or behind me. So, 
Um, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. So slow, careful, um, consideration for where everyone is, um, and will be in the fall. And this could all be different in the fall. So. Yeah. Very good. Very well said. <clears throat> Other questions. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to share with you, um, the work that we've done in preparation for eight through 12, a couple of things that we've done uh, here tonight. We have Eric Gray uh, from Edward Little High School, Sean McGaw from AMS, Stephanie Maris from Fairview. They are assistant principals and they very courageously took on the challenge uh, to develop uh, standard operating procedures for um, schools to use. And uh, to be clear, just like we are with our students, we make SOPs to, to create efficiencies and environments conducive for learning. Well, we want that same thing to, to come about here in uh, the coming week for our staff. Um, so they're going to share that. And then we have one of our nurses, Beth St. Laurent from Fairview here tonight. She worked with Stephanie Weber, uh, our tech coach, uh, to create a presentation about COVID-19 and um, safety procedures that all of our staff will be uh, trained in both of these modules. So why don't I hop off? And one of our assistant principals, whoever the lucky one is, can jump on and they're going to share with you the SOPs. I can share. Sean or Eric, stay unmuted and you can jump right along too. Um, we collaboratively worked together to highlight um, from a very long list of procedures and protocols that needed to be um, presented to staff in an easy, accessible way so that we were transparent and we were focused on um, safely bringing our staff back into our buildings. So this um, slide deck training is being shared with all staff before returning for workshop days next week in collaboration with the training videos that Beth St. Lauren and Stephanie Weber have organized as well. Um, our introduction says that the Auburn School Department is concerned with the health and safety of all staff. We are excited to be able to begin to reopen our buildings on a limited basis. These protocols must be adhered to in order to limit the risk to one another. As you know, information and recommendations are continuously changing and being adjusted. And this version of the protocols is based on the current best practices and guidance from the CDC, State of Maine, and our medical partners. It is the goal of the Auburn School Department for everyone to show respect for coworkers by maintaining hygiene standards. These protocols are intended for the staff only days of June 8th to 12th and may be extended. Our overarching theme that we wanted to really highlight for our staff is that focus of respect and that by coming back together and being respectful, that unites all of us in our common goal as we return back to our buildings. That's that thing that you were referring to again, Karen. Um, everyone's on the continuum and adults are on the continuum of where this, uh, where they believe this, uh, this, this virus uh, is at. And so we just are going to appeal to everyone's ability to respect their coworkers. And we're fortunate to have a staff that is highly respectful um, and work well as a team. So we anticipate that that's, that's, uh, that will be, that will be how people approach this. Um, expectations following the protocols shows respect for coworkers by maintaining hygiene standards, which helps to limit the chances of anyone contracting COVID-19. We have no expectation that any staff member come to school in person. If you have any reason to, that you feel that you are not comfortable, please join us remotely from your residence. So all staff are being presented with opportunities to either attend to workshop days in person in the building or by participating from home um, via digital means. Who is in the building? Staff only. Um, we are being clear that although we love the family and um, presence of our staff workers, 
that during this time, in order to maintain safe numbers on premises, that only staff members are accessing the building. Um, and we are limiting that. So certain staff are larger than the 50 limit. Um, in particular for Eric, Sean and I, we all have a staff that's over 50 teachers or 50 people that would be in a building. So we've developed um, plans with our staff in order to accommodate that. Before arriving at school each day, it's expected that staff members will log into a Google form for the COVID-19 help clearance checklist, and they will complete the building attendance log. The checklist kind of goes through that step-by-step -step question of, am I feeling well? Do I have a temperature? Go to that symptom checklist. And the building attendance log is a way for us to not only track the number of people we have in the building, but also for staff who might feel less comfortable with many people on site, they can kind of see, oh, there aren't many people in at this time of day. That might be a time I'm more likely to go into the building should I need to. The purpose of this protocol is to self-assess um, possible exposure. If staff have symptoms or possible ex exposure, we're encouraging them to work from home. Um, if you cannot or do not complete the checklist, you will be asked to not enter the building. This is the checklist that um, Stephanie Weber and Beth St. Lawrence worked on creating digitally so that all staff um, can either save this as a bookmark or use a QR code. We also will have paper copies available at the schools for any like contracted staff or anyone who might be coming to enter the building. They will also be expected to complete this protocol. If a staff member answers yes to any of the questions in the checklist, they're being encouraged to work from home and contact their personal health care professionals. When arriving at school, um, we're encouraging staff to follow the posted check-in procedure every time they enter the building. All staff are expected to wear a mask, to sign into the attendance log, and then every building has a designated main entrance to reduce touch points into the building. So um, like at Fairview, we have many access points, ways to get into the building. We are only using our main entrance as the way into the building. And additionally, every building has designated an exit point as well, again, to reduce the touch point and contact. Oops, I think I skipped one. When in the building, masks was, must be worn at all times unless they are alone in a room. Maintaining social distance recommendations of six feet, even with the mask on. Please follow posted occupancy for hotspot areas, such as the main office or the teacher's room or areas where people tend to gather for that social connection piece that we're just kind of drawn to different parts of the building. Um, or in smaller spaces, making sure that we're being mindful of being able to maintain that six foot distance. Only using designated restrooms while in the building and to disinfect after each use. Um, again, to make sure that only one person is in a restroom area at one time, and we're, again, minimizing that contact. Food and drink storage in common refrigerators will not be an option during workshop days, and school kitchens will be off limits. Please plan accordingly. Staff will eat alone in their classrooms during workshop days. They should not share equipment or materials without disinfecting. Um, and we will, they're being supplied with the materials needed in order to disinfect around copiers and other shared equipment. And anytime they're doing disinfecting, they need to be using gloves in between, which we are also providing for staff. Um, and then when leaving the building, they're asked to exit through the designated door, maintain social distancing, and then to sign out of the building attendance log so that we can keep track of who is in the building at any time. Um, and again, reminding about our theme of respect that together we can work to maintain respect for the health, wellness, and safety of one another. And that is our module training. Anyone have any questions or comments? I think uh, this is uh, Eric Gray, by the way, one of the uh, the APs. I'm, I'm up at Edward Little. I just wanted to chime in. Um, you know, we, we put a lot of work into um, this particular um, presentation that 
we have shared with our with our staff uh, to go with it though um, is is going to be signage um, you know in our building um, that signage is going to uh, support the message um, you know we're trying to get people to sort of adjust and change their behavior um, and so the signage you know the constant reminder um, is going to be something in our hallways um, there's going to be um, you're going to have administrators, you know, modeling, obviously, uh, out and about being vis- visible, um, doing even, you know, spot checks. We're, you know, enlisting sort of um, our teacher leaders as well um, to help us remind people. Because I think that's really what it will be is reminders. It's not, I, in my opinion, it's not really going to be people not wanting to follow. Uh, it's just going to be more reminders. And so um, this provides a really, I think, a really nice framework that's understandable. Um, and then now it's just, you know, reinforcement, I guess. Um, and you know, it's nice to have this, uh, before we have kids, uh, this is a nice, um, opportunity to see how adult learners do with, with new SOPs and, um, you know, help us out when we, we get our adolescents back, when we get our teenagers. So, yeah. It also gives us that opportunity to really, um, test some of these early, practices to see how they're working with a smaller group. And then we can scale up from there and figure out, you know, if there are choke points in our building and things like that, where we have more of an issue um, where we will have to plan around those. So it gives us that opportunity to really look deeply and, um, and begin to test it out. So. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, so when you talked about taking your temperature, everyone's going to take it at home. They're not going to take it in the building when you walk in. Is that Correct. the plan? Correct. Okay. I think it's, I think you guys have done a great job. Um, it seems like you've covered all the bases um, from a medical standpoint. Um, I think you guys have done a great job. So I commend you all. Well, I don't think I don't see. Uh, yep. Yeah, he's on the call. I can say that uh, we had a delivery from Billy's department today to Fairview of our um, cleaning supplies. We have gloves that are coming tomorrow and um, and Billy's here. He can answer more, but I know ours arrived at Fairview. Hi there. We've we've already got a lot of the materials and I believe the rest is, is on its way or arrived today. Exactly. We've delivered gloves, uh, most of the size gloves that we have. We have some small to mediums that we couldn't fill the orders with, uh, but we're getting those tomorrow. Uh, mask has been sent. Sanitizer has been sent. A disinfectant uh, spray and some paper towels. Um, and we do have thermometers coming in tomorrow if people do want those. Uh, and we do have a good supply of it and more coming in uh uh, within the next couple of weeks. So uh, we've been very fortunate to get a hold of a lot of good stuff, uh, and, which is very hard to do right now. Uh, but uh, uh, the staff has done a great job and I think we'll be all set for next week. And Billy's promised he hasn't gone out, down any alleys to buy any of these supplies. So. <laughs> yeah. Not, not yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> we would. I have and, I'm sorry. I have a question about the gloves. Um, as a medical person, and I know Beth can attest that too. We use gloves per person. Like when we go into a patient's room, we use a pair of gloves, we take them off and that's it. Now with this whole COVID-19, I've experienced a lot of times when I go to the grocery store and people are wearing gloves and they're touching everything and they're just basically doing what I would be doing without gloves. So my only concern with the gloves is that I just... I don't want them being used instead of hand sanitizer. Do you know what I mean? Like that's my only concern. Cause that's what I've been seeing in the general yeah. public is that's how gloves are being used. And that is not the essence of gloves. <laughs> right. Stephanie, I don't know if it was on the PowerPoint that you shared, but there was a conversation this morning about when gloves would be used and when they would not be used. So, so that was used staff are expected to wear, the staff are expected to wear gloves when disinfecting. That's the time that we're telling, like when they're using, um, when they're cleaning a shared space or when they're cleaning the restroom, that's where we're keeping the gloves for them to use when they're disinfecting. 
Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Rose, did you have another question? Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I would be amiss if I didn't ask, um, but can we estimate what we've spent um, on these materials um, additionally, just so that we know, and we can keep that in the back of our head. Is there kind of a dollar amount that we've spent? I, I don't have a dollar amount on my behalf yet. Uh, and that's where we have all the invoices, but nobody's really tallied them up. A lot of this stuff comes a little bit today, a little bit yesterday, a little bit the day before, uh, and nobody's really done a tally on it. Uh, a lot of it was to get the, enough product in hand, uh, the big rush, uh, to get it in hand so we would have it for next week. Uh, so we can definitely get you a tally of what we spent uh, on the extra, but I, and, I do not have it right now. Okay, oh, yeah. and you know, that's not my intention, you know, as far as um, it, obviously getting the materials in now is important, but um, just, you know, with budget and everything, Yep. Um, it would be curious, you know, to see how much of that have we spent. Yeah, I'm sure absolutely. Adam wants to chime in on this. This should all be reimbursable through the CARES Act, I would imagine. Yeah. Whenever that uh, catches up. Which is something to keep in mind because when we're thinking about what we're spending for CARES Act money and, you know, this, that, and the other way, we, you know, need to know what we're spending. Um, I'll just chime in on that real quick. I think, you know, we're, we're certainly in the several thousands of dollars on, on additional uh, funds spent to date. And so that just gives you a little taste of what school reopening might look like. As far as the CARES Act and the budget, uh, anything that we're buying right now for this year, I'm just planning to charge to the current year budget so that we don't tap into those CARES dollars yet. But we are allocating a large amount of, of the CARES dollars for it, knowing that we're going to need additional cleaning supplies when we reopen school. So that's something we will definitely definitely be looking at as we continue our committee work on the re-entry is how we're going to pay for everything. That we need. This will definitely help give us an estimation tool um, to scale up for, you know, entire buildings and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Great there, point, Rose. Great point. Adam, you, you had once said something about, um, oh, FEMA keeping track of our expenditures as well. Yeah, we're, we're keeping track of everything that's a COVID-related expense for possible FEMA reimbursement, and we have been getting that to the city. I haven't heard anything back. It's on my to-do list to check in with them to see what they know about where things stand and how much reimbursement we might be getting. So once I know more on that, I will uh, keep everyone posted on that, but that'll help uh, at least with the current cost. I don't know how long that'll go, but... So as I get more info, I'll pass that on. And we're we're listening about the new heroes stimulus monies that just passed as well, and waiting to hear about that as that gets distributed out to states. Good question. Okay. All right. Uh, I think was Beth next. Beth is next. All right, Beth, you have the floor. Everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, just wanted to thank the Health and Safety Committee and all the work they've put in to these discussions so far. Um, the approach that's been taken to put it in, into everything so far, these screening tools. Um, so, you know, the point was to really just go with the workshop week and focus on that, see how things went. Um, so what we did was we went with the CDC guidelines, like you saw with Stephanie's checklist. Do you want me to do screen share? Yes. Okay. I'm not really good at this, but I think Would you I like can. Me too? I can do it while you're talking if you like. No, I'm just going to say I'm really impressed because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, how's this? Is this okay? Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Now I just have to figure out. Okay, here we go. So, um, Steph Weber made this cute. I didn't make this cute. So I'm very <laughs> thankful for that. So this is what the nurses put together for information using the CDC guidelines that we thought would be best to have along with a little education. Um, you know, our, our thing was what we wanted to do, like what can we do to diminish risks and go through the workday smoothly? So, um, this is just a little introduction. 
Um, we've taken the CDC guidelines and created this document for review prior to our workshop week. Let's work together to do our best to protect ourselves and colleagues by minim minimizing our exposures. Um, and here is where the checklist is. Um, what's brilliant is Steph Weber put this, like Steph Mara said, on um, those little scanners, the QR codes on the door for people that, you know, have smartphones. Or like she said, it is going to be available on paper and you can copy and paste it to your browser. So it's totally accessible. Um, but for those that might need help, we can lead them through that too. So they're going to go through this at home and be expected to do this before they come to school. Um, I won't read through them all um, because Steph did that. But basically, if they answer yes to any of the questions, they will not enter the building. Actually, when they take this survey and they click yes, the survey will stop. Um, and direct them, yeah. Right. So here's where the QR code is um, and where that they can bookmark, you know, and paste things to their browsers for them to get to the checklist. Um, masks will be provided. They're going to be asked to wear their mask while in the building. And then just a little bit of information, how to con, how to con, sorry, how to come in contact with someone with another person infected with the virus. Um, basically just precautions. Cute picture. And then what to do if someone at their home is sick. So just a few talking points there, which I plan to do um, with our staff beforehand. Social distancing, what everybody's familiar with, you know, if there's not awareness right now since COVID, I don't know what there is. I know that we've had enough awareness, but it's good to hear it. And it's good for, for our staff to see that, that we know and we're doing everything we can to promote safety. Protection tips, just about cleaning services. Don't touch your eyes and your nose. Wash your hands frequently. Um, PPE, gloves and masks. And then later on here, I think coming up, there's going to be a couple of videos on how to, it sounds silly, but put on and take off a mask, doing it right. And Pam, what you just said earlier about gloves is a good point because I should definitely be going over how to put on and take off gloves after they're done disinfecting um, in the bathroom. A lot of people know, but it's definitely good to hear. And just a few videos. These are mostly from um, CDC for how to cover your coughs and sneezes. Basic, again, very basic, but nothing overwhelming. And there's the one about how to properly put on and take off your mask. And then there's a little area here for feedback, which is always good because, you know, I feel like this is good, but I don't, I don't really know how this is going to go. I've never done this before. So I'm anxious to see, you know, what we can improve on after this and what to expect for when we have kids. And here's their sign off. Great. Good. Yeah, we, this was designed. Thank you so much, Beth. Again, the work that you all did um, to put this thank together. You. Steph's help was fabulous. Um, this module, these modules d were designed to either be used in a whole group um, in staff meetings or small groups in department meetings uh, or as individual independent modules that teachers can access um, independently. So that's why we have that. Another reason why we have the feedback form. We want to hear from people, but we, you know, it's also, it's different when you can't ask Beth say, who's doing a presentation in a, in a staff meeting. Oh, I have this question. So we want to make sure we hear that and I'll be monitoring um, that document as it comes in. So basically people will come in the building. They will have um, filled out the screening tool, which is from the CDC. Uh, it's the same tool that, uh, was recommended to us by Deputy Chief uh, Fifield. They're using it with the city. They'll uh, log in. The secretaries will have, uh, they will dump into a spreadsheet, which the secretaries will have on their uh, computer. And as people enter the building, they'll be monitoring to make sure that, that folks have um, actually done, you know, filled out the checklist before they, they entered. And as Eric said, uh, you know, we'll help anybody who has forgotten that um, or had difficulty in doing that. So that's how that piece will work. 
So I don't want to jump in. Do you, I, do you have more to the presentation? No, that was it. The, any questions on for Beth? Again, this is another great, you, I think you guys have very thoughtfully covered all aspects that need to be covered in order for everybody to be safe and to feel safe. And um, I really commend you for all your hard work. You guys have done a great job. Yeah, it, it, truly. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So for those of you who would like to hang on, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm not sure if anyone wants yeah, to. We, we have more. We have more. Okay. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, that was just for this week. And so oh, now. Oh, sorry. Nice. Yeah. Now, we're, yeah. Shifts to kind of that summer focus, what's been going on in some other departments. Yeah, go ahead, Katie. So um, I did invite other folks to talk about summer programming because um, I know there's been questions about what we're doing this summer. So I'm going to start with Sue Doris. Um, it's just going to go over, you know, what is summer school looking like, um, what we're doing a little bit differently this year in, in response to some things. So Sue, do you want to just say what's going on regarding summer school? Um, yes. And uh, so you're on. Okay. Um, well, we won't be having our traditional on-site summer school programs this year. Um, we're going to be doing everything remotely. And uh, the good news is we do have plans to support our students from a distance. So at the elementary level, I think you've heard a little bit about this, but we're providing all of our students with books to read during the summer. And our current pre-K through sixth graders will all be receiving book bags. And as Katie mentioned at the last school committee meeting, we took some action steps from Richard Allington's research on summer reading loss. And that research tells us that the first and most important step in preventing summer reading loss is to put books in the hands of kids. And this is especially important when we look at closing the achievement gap because not all of our families have access to books. So as a matter of fact, today, the first shipment of books came into Washburn and we've had crews working on putting those books together and our next big shipment is coming in tomorrow. And we're gonna be getting those books out this week to kids. And I think we're all just really excited that we are going to be able to provide these books to all of our students. Um, they're high interest, they're leveled um, based on student needs. And we're also going to be sending home summer reading logs and, and schools will be using a variety of reading incentive programs to encourage the reading. So that's what's going on at the elementary level. Uh, the middle and high school are still fi finalizing their plans for summer school programming. And again, everything's going to be done remotely, uh, but they're both going to be providing a combination of tutoring, remedial work, and course credit options for students. And just a little bit about the middle school, the math department is going to offer remedial instruction and also some options for students who have like a unit or two left in math, in their math class. Um, this option allows students to finish up their class and start at a higher level in the fall. And the PE teacher at AMS is offering a Zoom program to help students stay active this summer. And there'll also be some support for students in English language arts. And at the high school, the support will be similar. Uh, but it will be focused on providing students with uh, courses and credits to make sure that they're on track for graduation. Um, and then they'll do the same thing with remedial work and options for kids who are very close to finishing up a course. And that's what we have planned right now for our summer school programming. Any, any questions? Karen, you're on mute. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, oh, thank sorry. you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you. Um, and Sarah, so Sarah Levine from our child care, um, our director will talk to you about the plans for child care. Sarah? Okay. So, yeah, we are at Sherwood Heights. We're starting on June 22nd um, through August 7th. 
uh, which is our normal seven week session that we do every year. Um, but this year we're having fewer kids so that we stay under the ratios. We have about 30 to 35 at this point um, with about eight to 10 staff. So staying under the 50 uh, total. Um, and we have our COVID protocol laid out, um, but it is ever changing as is all of this. Um, so it, it's very flexible. You know, we've <laughs> talked to the parents about how they're gonna need to be flexible um, as we have no idea what's gonna happen. I mean, none of us, this is, this is this uncharted territory for all of us. Um, we, the buses are not at this point are not running. Um, so we're not doing any field trips. So we will be on site, which is very different for us. Um, so we've changed up our, um, cu curriculum a bit. Um, usually we do science, art, and physical activity, our three tracks. And this year we added in, we have a uh, karate teacher and a dance teacher that are going to be coming in and teaching classes with social distancing. Um, and we added also, we talked to K6 teachers because those are the age groups that we have. Um, and we're going to be doing some um, reading and math also as well to help with the, you know, besides just the summer slide, the, the last couple months slide, which I know my children have been having to. Um, so we're hoping to help out with that as well. And then using what we've learned um, during the summer to inform what the fall might be able to look like. Um, creating SOPs. I know we've done SOPs for the teachers, but in the next week or two, my staff is going to start working on SOPs for the students in, in inside the schools. X is on the floor. I mean, who knows? We have no idea what it's going to look like. So, you know, it's <laughs> we're flying by the seat of our pants, and you know, we're gonna we're gonna see what what works for these small groups. Um, Thirty kids, you know, so like a classroom, a little more than, than a classroom's worth of kids. Um, so we can see what it might look like come the fall. Any, any questions for Sarah? So I know Sarah, Sarah and Chris Pierce, who's going to be up next, they, they're always thinking about a month out, uh, two months. I mean, Sarah in March was like, can we talk about some, you know, she already was thinking, I, I got to think about so, and Chris with the, uh, the meal service there, they both have been very proactive in trying to be ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Um, so Chris, do you want to talk about, um, meals and what you're doing starting January 8th? Katie, can I, mean, I just ask Sarah, sorry, can I ask Sarah a quick question? Sure. Um, Sarah, just curious how we, um, did we, was it first come first serve that we limited to, to the 35 kids just in case somebody asks? How do we decide? Yeah, it's it's mostly the kids that are that, that are in our child care program during the year. Okay, perfect. Um, but it was it was opened up to the public on our website, um, which is on on the upper school department website um, in February. Okay, <laughs> and it was full within a couple days. But okay, so we didn't really we didn't kick anybody out. It was just once it was no full. no no, okay, no. Good. And okay, we, and because people have pulled their kids because they're still working from, from home. We have been able to open up the wait list okay. um, for all Thank kids you. that have asked. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, any other questions for Sarah? Okay. And what I was saying before when I was muted was, um, thank you, Dr. Doris. I love knowing that there are books going home in kids' hands for the summer. So thank you. I didn't realize it was muted at the time. So thank you. I wanted to make sure I got that in. <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, Chris. Thank you. I wish I had a nice presentation with all the graphics. <laughs> those, those were nice. Um, so effective Monday, we're transitioning to uh, summer feeding uh, where we incorporate um, we actually started the Y on Monday already. I'm um, providing the meals for them as well. Um, our meal pickups, we're planning to go right through the summer with them. On um, the three days a week, um, we are closing some sites and reducing the times. Um, some of it's a staffing uh, reasonings, um, reduction of staff over the summer with the end of the school year. Um, still covering as much ground as we can and you know, providing the needs. Um, as, as best as we can. Um, so our plan is to incorporate the summer sites into the, the meal pickups that we have in place now on the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Um, we have the rec coming into the schools. We have the daycare that um, Sarah had just spoken about. Um, so working on basically fusion, fusing the two of them together. 
um, the meal pickups with the, um, with the summer programs. Um, we have our SOPs in place. Um, we just provided them recently with all the um, updated information from the CDC. Um, and, uh, you know, all the information that the, uh, the reentry committee um, has been providing. Um, so we have all that in place. Um, yeah, we're, we're in it for the long haul. Um, that's kind of what the expectation is and um, we're ready for that. And I think that's what the situation calls for. I think um, we're still, since March, I think we're probably, we've done over, I think 90,000 meals, excuse me, um, that we've provided. Um, we've had some great donations that we've thrown in. Um, we had a dentist's office drop off a bunch of um, little dental bags for the kids today. So we gave those out as well, um, which was a nice kind of treat. Um, there's been a lot of support and it's been, um, it's been uh, just great to kind of witness it all. Um, so, um, so that's the plan for now. Um, you know, we're remaining flexible as well. Um, you know, to any changes that we come across, um, we're trying to keep ourselves safe, the community safe. Um, we do the face mask, we do the gloves. Um, we've been doing it for some time and we're somewhat used to it. It's, um, somewhat, we'll call it normal, but it's kind of, we've fallen into a little bit of a routine. Um, so, you know, just kind of with the induction of people into the buildings, we're kind of trying to keep that going on as well. Um, you know, keeping us to, uh, We'll say out on an island, if you will, but, you know, keeping our, our program going and safely. And um, that's kind of where we're at now. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. And that has um, his information has been updated on the website about um, what's going to happen Monday. Tomorrow, I'm doing a uh, kind of final robocall to let families know tomorrow's uh, Friday will be the last day of remote learning. Um, thank them for all their hard work and also mention that um, the meal pickups will continue throughout the summer. So there will be a robocall going out tomorrow to all families with that, that update as well. Uh, so, can, can you mention which schools, which four schools will be continuing the pickups as of Monday? Of course. Um, Sherwood, uh, Walton, Washburn, and Park Avenue. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I have Todd Sampson also here to talk to you about what's going on in the uh, sports, um, you know, talking about summer and what, what he's able to do at this point. I know he's been attending a lot of meetings with the Maine Principals Association and um, with his associations around what they're going to do for the summer. And uh, so, Todd, do you want to kind of talk about where your where your department is at this time? Sure. Thank thank you, Katie. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put you on uh, information overload. I, I feel like there's a lot to you folks tonight. Um, but kudos to Michelle and Shelley for the organization of this group. It's as a as a parent and an employee, it puts me at ease um, to know that that the plans are in place for us to try to get back to some type of normal. So we had good news this week. We were able to reopen our tennis courts June 1st with social distancing. So we have four of the six nets that are up on the courts. And I think every day, other than today's little storm, little shower, uh, the courts have been filled. So I think people, and some of you mentioned about getting your kids back to school as quick as possible. I think people are itching to get outside and be active and, and uh, get some exercise. So every day we get, uh, we get some good news and the light is at the end of the tunnel. But uh, the MPA has really broken down things into the summer programming, which is big for our kids and our coaches. And then what would it look like uh, in the fall starting August 17th? So right now uh, we're still in our spring season. You know, the coaches that uh, you guys graciously gave that uh, partial stipend to are still reaching out to kids, still recognizing seniors, uh, still doing Zoom meetings. Dave Jordan and Elaine DeRoseby had kids on Monday night uh, in a Zoom meeting with a national uh, recognized coaching leadership course. So good things are happening. Um, so we'll, we'll keep going forward with that until June 20th. And then the MPA has switched their hands off period 
which normally happens the first two weeks in August, they've put them the last two weeks of June. So at that point, those last two weeks in June, uh, no coaches, spring, fall, winter can have any contact with their kids, uh, Zoom, any, any kind of um, plans for them to, for skill improvement. And what that did for them is it kind of bought them some more time to catch up to the governor's phase, phase in plans. So on July 6th, our coaches, if they choose to, can have direct one-on-one -on -one contact uh, with their student athletes. What that will look like is uh, undecided at this point. We'll lean on the main uh, Principals Association Sports Medicine, Medicine Committee, who will kind of give us some guidelines. Social distancing, uh, pods of less than 10, disinfecting of equipment, all of those things are still uh, being worked out right now. But that will be July 6th. And hopefully that's going to give uh, our coaches and, and our students some, some opportunity to come back and just be with their friends again and, and get outside and, and get some mental, emotional, physical uh, health back to it. I think that we're all hoping for. Um, the, the next big plan is going to be August 17th is coming quickly. And uh, what is that going to look like? Because that's going to even be before we come back into the school building. And that's when fall athletics start for the high school. So the plans are in place. Um, the National Federation of Sports, who uh, govern all and, and write all of the high school athletic rules, put out a, a great, very detailed 16-page document. So we're going to lean on that heavily as what those phases uh, will be for fall athletics. And just like anything, uh, it, it comes in levels. There's going to be a few sports that are going to be very easy for us to get back on board. Uh, cross country and golf, we can social distance. I mean, if I was running a cross country race, it would be social distance because I'd be more than six feet behind everybody. Uh, on the golf course, uh, you, you see the golf courses now, they're packed, right? Um, so those two sports are going to be real easy. Uh, the next level of kind of moderate will be field hockey and soccer that there's going to really have to be some thought going into uh, how we run practices, how we test, how we uh, clear kids for practices and, and those types of things. But they're looking at all the same things that you've already seen with, with the screenings and the temperature taking for our staff coming back in June, we'll do that for our athletes in August. Um, should we be cleared? And, and that is, is what will keep our kids safe. So the, the big one out there that everybody wants to talk about is football and how do you socially distance in football? Um, that's going to be a challenge. And I, I don't have any answers for you tonight on that, but I know that the Federation and the MPA are working closely on uh, what, what we can do uh, for that sport. And the other, the other piece kind of moving forward is, is, um, yes, it is all about the student athletes, but it's also about, uh, game personnel that need to be there. It's about our officials. It's about parents that want to come see their children. And what will that look like with social distancing at, uh, at games? Uh, and quickly, just, just to wrap up, we're going to, we've got some great, uh, people in this town, the Auburn rec department with Sabrina best, they are, uh, they are rock solid and, uh, they're doing great things with their softball program right now. That's going on our, the summer track program will start at a little June 15th on the track. And we're going to, we're going to learn a lot from them as far as, um, what went well what they might have wanted to improve on. And uh, we'll, we'll be watching them closely. And I think I shared with Michelle this morning, the state of Iowa um, is already running their interscholastic baseball and softball programs. They do that normally in the summer. And they had their first practices Monday. And they're going to be playing games June 15th. So uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, learning from them and, and getting best practices as how do you run a, a practice and sanitize and disinfect and keep everybody safe. So we've got a, we've got a lot of planning to do. We've got a lot of learning to do, but uh, I, I think everybody is, is, you know, to kind of 
you know, voice what Eric Gray said earlier. Let's just um, be respectful of everybody. It's a new learning and uh, we'll get through this together. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, Ryan, will you t uh, talk about um, uh, special ed programming for the summer? Sure, no problem. Um, good evening, everybody. So special education likes our summer school program will be done remotely. Uh, that's the recommendation from the Department of Education. So typically our program starts uh, the second to the first Tuesday after 4th of July. So that's the 7th. And we run three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And we end on uh, Thursday, the 7th of the 6th of August. So we run for five weeks. Uh, this year, we're going to be doing, again, everything remotely. Um, a typical day for a student will be probably roughly an hour and a half, maybe two hours a day. That depends on what uh, the instruction. For some, it could be less. And for some, it could be more. So we're thinking of uh, basically you know, the areas of reading, writing, math, and executive functioning. Those are uh, what we call specially designed instruction skill category areas. And then we also have uh, related services, such as speech language, occupational therapy, um, and any other type of service that's in that category. So, um, and that's all based on IEP team decisions on what needs to be remediated over the summer. Uh, so we look at uh, we look at this rate of lack of recoupment. How quickly does it take children to recoup? And if it's a significant amount more than typical students, then they qualify for summer programming. So, and because of there, there's not a, a social component, like typically when you're face to face, there's a social component. You might be able to do some gardening and integrate, you know, math and and uh, and and some reading and and, and different you know, science aspects and incorporate a lot of different um, academic areas to make it interesting and fun and to fill up a, a kind of longer span of time. But doing it remotely really allows us to give kids in small groups and really gives uh, really focused instruction. That's a really nice cat there. Uh, I'm super, Madam Superintendent, I appreciate you not distracting me. As you know, I'm easily distracted. So that's okay. So um, I'm listening, so was, Ryan. I'm fully focused on you. Yes, yes perfect. All right. So that uh, I... But you know I get distracted easy, so you do that on purpose. See, that's, that's what I'm saying. All right, so for August, we're thinking of, so depending on what the, the DOE says, if we're able to start integrating students back into our schools and that's, uh, you know, following guidelines, then we might bring some students back in August. So probably the week of August 20th, and we're thinking of our functional life skills population. So students that are, attend our EDD program at Fairview, Team Achieve at the middle school, our autism program at Walton, and our students in our functional life skills program at the high school. And if we have the opportunity, I'd love to bring them back into groups of one and two for a couple hours, uh, a couple times before the school starts. And, you know, if we have different hallways that have one direction, practicing walking the hallways, wearing masks, uh, social distancing, you know, using hand sanitizer, new bathroom practices, and also as an opportunity for our staff to practice those things as well, to get used to those protocols and, and reminders and seeing you know, are there certain pitfalls that we're that we ourselves as adults are running into, but also students? And then it also will, will provide us opportunities to provide compensatory education for for, for students that we, we we know that this six months gap in face to face instruction will cause. Uh, and that's something that we'll have to address in the fall. The other thing I want to quickly address about summer school programming is, as you know, we have many students that attend special purpose private schools within our community. Um, and those schools make their decisions about what they're going to do with students independently of us. Um, they are they are not public schools. They are private businesses. And so they fall under different uh, rules and recommendations from, from the government than we do from the state government. Um, so, again, they're seen as businesses. And so depending on the size of their school, their business determines what stage of reopening, reentry they are. So Margaret Murphy Center for Children is a very large organization, but they have many centers uh, in Lewis and in Auburn, and those centers are much smaller than 50 students. So there also is the Renaissance School, and the Renaissance School is located at the the, um, oh, the church part. Um, I forgot the name of the church, but it's in that, it's in that uh, uh, the church area close to the high school, and that school Sacred is... Heart. Yeah, Sacred here we go. Heart. Yeah. Sacred Heart. Perfect. Sacred Heart. All right. So they are about 50 people. And so they're, they're in stage two. So they're not able to open until in July and they're going to do that. So what we've been doing is, uh, uh my secretary, uh, uh, 
my administrative assistant, Diane Chamberlain, has created a spreadsheet that has all of our special purpose private schools in them. And Laura Shar, our special services coordinator, is calling every single parent of the Renaissance School and of Margaret Murphy, because those are the two that are going back to face to face to see, you know, are they interested in sending their children back? What are their questions or concerns about that? And do they need transportation? Are they willing to provide transportation? Because we'll reimburse them for that and just have a conversation. So we started that. Margaret Murphy is doing the same thing with the families. Um, I think that's a really important component. Um, transportation is tricky. Billy and I have talked several times already. Uh, we might, we have a, 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 most of our families are, are willing to transport their own children, but some are not. So we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, what that, what does that look like? Um, how do we do that safely? Are we able to utilize some of our smaller vehicles, like in our vans, that will you know minimize uh, uh, contact with with our drivers? So these are all things to be think to, to be thought about and to plan for and to take the recommendations of uh, of our lo local officials and and, and the and the state Department of Education and work collaboratively. So that's what we have so far. We'll make decisions later in July about what we do in August. Nice. Right. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Um, the last person, Billy, can you talk about how you're working with the rec department? Because the rec department will be using our facilities um, with their with their programming. Yeah, so they're trying to run their regular summer programming, uh, naturally following all the guidelines uh, established by the state. Uh, so they're working on less than 50 people per site. Uh, currently, uh, they were going to have four of our schools this summer. Uh, we just approved the fourth one today. Um, so they're going to be in, uh, they're all elementary schools. Um, and, um, so they're going to have, um, uh, I believe, I believe around 40 kids and 10 staff, but they're following, they have their own protocols. They've been very working, uh, ver working very closely with, uh, Matt Fifield at the fire department also, uh, with their protocols and establishing, uh, they're testing as they arrive, what they're going to do if uh, somebody does test positive. Uh, and uh, as they mentioned earlier, Matt's done a great job with the city and he's done a great job with the rec department. So uh, we're very happy with what they have accomplished. I think they can run a very good program this summer uh, for as many kids as they possibly can. Uh, naturally, they are limited like everybody else at this point in time but it gives the opportunity for a number of our uh, younger kids that at least have some type of uh, summer playground this summer. Well, did you say that they're going to do testing? They are going to do the thermometer testing when children arrive. Oh, screening. Oh, I, I thought I went yeah. through the COVID test. I'm like, wow. No, no. They're, just got, they're going to make sure nobody has a temperature and, and do a little questionnaire, make sure uh, everybody's hasn't been out of the country in the last 14 days. Right. And, all those questions, uh, just to be safe uh, and to make sure they're doing the best they can. And uh, they've told us that if, for instance, a track program, if one kid comes down uh, with a positive test, the entire program shuts down for the summer. Um, so uh, Matt's done a great job with them, and uh, the people down at the rec department have done a super job getting ready for this. Uh, and they've been very cooperative with us, uh, understanding our concerns. Uh, and that's going into the buildings and stuff. Uh, they're going to do their own cleaning uh, so that our staff does not have to worry about it. They're limited to where they can go in the building. Most of the building is going to give them a gym, maybe one or two classrooms that are really nearby. So, and one set of bathrooms that uh, they can use uh, to minimize the area they go in, but to give them something to have a program. Yeah, so you can see it takes a village um, to, to do this kind of work. And, um, you know, as Todd said, Michelle and Shelly, you know, really stepped up in organizing and make sure the right people are at the table to work out all these details. Um, and, it, you know, it's just we have such an outstanding team working together, you know, in three meetings to be able to say what we've accomplished so far. Um, puts us in good hands moving forward as as we keep as we focus on the fall. So thank you to everyone for all their hard work. It's just outstanding. So I appreciate that. And if there are any other questions, um, we'll move on to the budget. Any other questions, anyone? All right. I absolutely um, reiterate what uh, Katie just said as well. Thank you all so very much. So very much.
All right. Moving on, moving on to business this evening, the recommended school budget. Uh, we have had the opportunity to, um, I'll just wait a second if people are exiting out. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we've had opportunity to have conversations around school budget from February, since February, really gone, um, uh, lots of, I would say lots of, um, opportunities to look closely, look carefully and make sure we are being as fiscally responsible as we can, um, keeping in mind, uh, really what the city council has asked and keeping in mind, um, what the bottom line and where we, where we want to come in as far as, um, impacting taxes. So at this point, um, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the recommended budget for the 2021 school year in the amount of 45 million eight hundred and two thousand six hundred and twelve dollars as presented. And I am going to do roll call because I cannot see you right now. So do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Brian Carrier. Can I have a second? Second. second. I think I heard Brian Belknap's voice there, so I'll take a second. And let's do roll call voice, uh, please. Ward one? Yes. Ward two? Yes. I'm with yes for ward three. Ward four? Yes. Ward five? Yes. Faith? Yes. Dave Simpson? Yes. And Brian Carrier? Yes. Motion passes eight nothing. All right, thank you. Next yeah. up, um, so Karen, don't I? Sorry. Um, first of all, thank you so much for for the the support of of the budget, and thank you for um, working with us and and uh, you know asking those questions and keep looking at things. And um, so you know, it, it may not have been everything we we started out with, but um, I think you've done a fiscally responsible budget that that is meeting the educational needs of the students um so thank you for that i know adam wants to share what you need to come in and sign so that if we're not there um it will be in the bump out room so uh, adam do you want to explain adam you may be muted i think you are adam yeah <laughs> <laughs> Start over again. Thank you. <laughs> so what I'm sharing is the, the one document that we need you to sign is this is the notice regarding the school budget amounts. And this is the document that hangs in the voting booth on the day of the referendum in July. So it basically just says the total budget breaks it out by cost by the 11 cost centers. It says that it was approved by the school committee and the city council. And I need uh, a majority of the school committee to sign. We would love to have everybody sign it. And we do have a little time to get that done. So as of tomorrow morning, I will put this in the small conference room here on the fourth floor at Auburn Hall. And you can stop by when you have a chance over the next week or two. Uh, we're, we're here pretty much from eight to four, Monday through Friday, somebody should be here. Um, you can just come in and, and sign, and uh, once we have all the signatures, we'll get it to the city. So, any questions on that document? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Policies. Shaw McClellan, you're on first reading of some policies. Great. Um, I just realized that I told. Beth St. Laurent, that she could leave, and probably it would have been good to have her in this conversation, um, but I'll do my best. Uh, the, the policies that we're looking at tonight uh, is the policy we're looking at tonight is JLCC, Communicable in Infectious Diseases, and we're also looking at uh, a piece of evidence that goes with that policy, and that's JLCC-E, and that's the health protocol that is sent home to parents, um, we actually include it in the handbooks um, so that parents have that at the beginning of the year or upon um, enrollment. So, uh, and Brian and Dan, please feel free to chime in um, as well. Excuse me. I'm just telling Beth she doesn't need to to do anything she's, she's offering. Um, 
so communicable diseases, we looked at this policy. Um, we've been actually, we've been looking at the nurses have been looking at this policy for a while. Um, and now with COVID-19, um, it, it actually changed some of the um, revision to this policy. There was very little revision to this policy prior to March. And then um, we looked at it again and said, yeah, we, we probably need to, we want to make some adjustments to this, this policy. This policy, when it was last reviewed, um, was really uh, looking, it was at a time when the AIDS epidemic was breaking out. And so it was reviewed with that in mind and the evidence piece was re uh, developed and, and revised with that in mind. Um, so we wanted to broaden the perspective uh, beyond that particular um, uh, health issue. And so there's just quite a bit of language that we um, put in there with updating kind of the new vernacular. Uh, you see CDC referenced in this new policy when you read it. Uh, you are hearing about, um, you know, confirmed cases and the role that the school plays in the community health plan. Those were all sections that were um, updated quite extensively uh, to align with current practices. So I'll stop there about communicable and infectious diseases, Brian or Dan, if you have anything to in ask or if anyone has any questions. Not a, not a question, Michelle, but just a quick comment. Um, and it's a, a minor detail, but we probably want to update it. At the very bottom of JLCC, it shows when it was, uh, no, just JLCC uh, in the packet that was sent out. Uh, it yes. shows when it was last revised. And it shows September 6, 95, January 5th, 2011. And we probably yes. ought to add the new date of it. Well, being, we haven't, we will, Brian, well, that, that will be after. done once we have the, the second approval. The, the okay. reading. That gets updated reading. after. Okay. Perfect. And then it goes on the website. It's a good question. I don't think we've talked about that, but then it goes on the website. Any other questions? I have a quick question. Sure. Okay. So when we were, you were showing us the presentation earlier, um, the COVID um, protocols, it said something about, and, and that, that could be wrong here. Did it say something about no temp or lower than a hundred percent? I mean, hundred percent lower than a hundred degrees um, Fahrenheit by for 72 hours. Cause this says 24 hours. And I was just wondering okay. if we should kind of. I think, I think Pam, you're on the, the dash E. This is just the JLCC one right now. Yeah, the G. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, I'm onto the E. Sorry. Okay. I'm hang on to that. But the yeah, I was yeah. Okay. Sorry. I think any other questions just regarding JLCC right now, the first one. Okay. Seeing none. All right. Are we ready to move on to dash E? Uh, you want to take a, a vote on, uh, I think, or do you want to do them individually? Or do you want to do them together? Uh, I think we have to do this one individually. It's, uh, uh needs two readings and okay. the CCE will require one reading. So that's the way we've typically done it is for the policy we've done. We voted on those as a batch and then we voted on, on the uh, procedures or Okay. So you want, so I'm just reading the agenda. So it just said the above listed policy. So I just assumed like that we did this last time too. I think that's what confused me the last time and it's confusing me this time as well. Okay. And I at first it's policy and then the procedures. I thoroughly understand that. So right now we're looking at just JLCC, uh, which is communicable and infectious disease um, the policy on that one. So can I entertain a motion to approve? This would be the first reading of JLCC. So moved. Thank you, Brian, can I second? I think that was Dave Simpson. I think it was Dave Simpson. It was. All right. Yeah. All right great. Uh, I'm getting good. I didn't realize I just recognize it. Voices only. All right. Um, any further conversation on this or are we ready to take a vote? Oh. All right. Let's take, let's take a vote. Uh, ward one. I was trying to help you, Karen. 
Did you, you unmute? Raise did, you, <laughs> did you un? Oh, there we go. Let's do it that way instead. Yeah. So let's take a let's take all show of hands for approval of the policy. Uh, unanimous. Eight nothing. Great. Motion passes. Okay. On to the next okay. one. JLCCE. And my head was down, Katie, because I'm trying to do roll call as I've got my little checklist of one, two. So I didn't even notice if we all came back on. All right, JLCCE. We've got a few things going on, Karen. <laughs> um, so the health protocol, yes, we did make some adjustments to this. This is the health protocol that uh, is going out, again, for, around students, not around staff. And at this time, you, you, you bring up a great point. Um, I'll, I'll jump to Pam's because it's now it's on my mind. We learned of the 72 hours today from Matt Fifield. Yeah. He said that they're using that with the city right now in this time. Uh, there's a, there's a word that you know is come into our everyday language and that is nimble. And we are being very nimble about things and we're adapting and um, so forth. The CDC guidelines talk about 24 hours um, and, and this does not, this is not in place for pandemic situations, pandemic situations. We would have to communicate more stringent guidelines that would include things like quarantining and, and that sort of thing. Um, but this is our general procedures for students, um, uh, who are sick to guide parents in making decisions about whether their child should come to school or not, uh, to guide parents in our decision-making process if a student comes to school and then demonstrates symptoms that are on this list about their being dismissed and going home. Um, it also makes parents aware of our precautions that we're using in, in the school, um, as well as uh, their return to school after being ill. So that's, that's the purpose of this. So it, it is tricky. And it, we spent a lot of time, Pam, talking about uh, how, how much do we document in this procedure, which will be in your policy manual and would need to be changed. Um, how much do we go into the specifics about COVID-19 or do we do what we did this year, which was put out guidance that was particular and specific to the, the health crisis that was facing us? So that was the decision-making process. I think, that's, I think that's a great idea. I think you did it. I think you chose the right idea to deal with this as a general and a pandemic, which hopefully pandemics will be far and few in between. So we won't have to worry about that as much, but this obviously will be something that, you know, may be used daily. So I, I, I agree with you completely. Okay. Good. Any other comments, questions? All right. Seeing none, let's take a vote. Uh, ready to make a motion. Sorry. Let's do the motion first. That was you, Dave. Yeah. Second. A motion, Pam, second. All right. And I can see you all. Motion to, uh, to what am I at right now? To approve the uh, policy JLCCE as a first reading. All those in favor, raise your hand, thumbs up. Motion passes. Good on that one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Committee reports. Uh, let's start with, I'm going to start with the, um, the standing committees of finance and then uh, policy subcommittee after that. So finance, anything to report for finance? Brian Carey or Dave Simpson? We've not had a meeting uh, yet this month. We're having it uh, uh, the 9th, the 11th, okay. uh, or the 10th, Adam, not completely. The 10th. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Policy subcommittee? Do you have a on? Uh, yeah, next week, uh, next Tuesday. You have an upcoming meeting? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, city council update. We had quite a discussion the other night in regards to the, not so much the budget, but the, uh, city and what Billy was talking about earlier about us opening the, the rec program. We are going to have six facilities right now. The enrollment set at about 171. 
they're hoping to stay within the 200 kid uh, threshold to make sure they have places. They still have a couple of problems that they're trying to work out. Uh, one of them being, what do you do on rainy days? Uh, and being able to keep the kids socially distanced and be able to sanitize everything the proper way. But they're uh, working those items out. They're also getting the uh, regular adult rec uh, started back up. So they're, they'll have that online. Uh, we did discuss the budget. We did bring it in, did bring up the fact that the school budget and where they, uh, we'd come in at, they didn't really get a lot of comments. So I will take that as a, uh, a good thing. And so far as us being able to get this done and that's basically it. I think uh, I noticed the Sun Journal this morning also made a correction. They, in um, some of the, um, the uh, monies that they quoted as far as uh, they did quote correctly that the um, both city and school were coming in um, with zero impact to taxes, but the amounts that they, I think they had to make some corrections as far as um, yeah. yeah, some increases. We didn't, we do not have a $1.2 million uh, increase as they, as they had originally reported. So um, yeah. Adam jumped right on that and emailed the reporter and Adam Robinson was the, not, yes, no, Andrew. Andrew Rice. Andrew Rice was the reporter, and he claimed that he took the numbers from the city manager's budget. So we made sure the city manager, again, got the correct numbers. I mean, we don't know. We didn't watch it, but um, that's what Andrew said is he took the numbers from the meeting. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, curriculum, moving on to curriculum subcommittee. We have a meeting coming up um, after um, after I think basically like next week with a uh, teacher workshop, the following week, um, is when we will be meeting, um, with Shelly for uh, curriculum subcommittee. Um, next community learning center, Mr. Simpson. Nothing to report Karen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the nothing to report on the new, uh, building committee as a committee. I don't know if you have any new information. Um, um, no, we had a deal. We did have a Department of Education meeting last week and uh, Mark and Lisa just got, you know, um, clarification around work that they're doing to get the bid papers completed. Um, we signed for the geothermal testing um, that is going to be done. Um, uh, so, yeah. And then the owner rep. Um, Adam, do you want to share about the owner rep that has been selected? Although it's not, it's not final because there's a 15 day appeals, but I guess we could, I don't know if we can publicly say something or not, Adam. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. So I won't say a name, but, uh, Billy and I participated in, I think a very thorough review of five applicants to be our owner's rep and technical consultant. And we, we all agreed on the top candidate. And as it so happened, the pricing was also uh, the best submitted of the five. So we are very pleased with the person that we got. And uh, I'm sure next time we get together, I can give you the name. But uh, we're very pleased with this person. And we're having an introductory meeting next week. So okay. great. Good luck forward. All right. Great. Uh, DEI. That's you, Pam. No, <laughs> no, nothing. Okay, great. Thank That's you. Um, Safety and health committee. We just had a great big presentation on, um, on where we're at with that. So that one's all set technology. Um, no, we haven't met, but I did see you send Peter a note today just to see if we could catch up next week. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, wellness. No, we have not met. Okay. Uh, audit subcommittee. We meet yeah, we, tomorrow. I was gonna say, we just found out today that the auditors want to meet tomorrow. <laughs> so I guess we're meeting with them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, the best I can. <laughs> be there tomorrow. Uh, yeah. So Faith and I are meeting with, uh, I think it's Tim and Katie Boss. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Uh, transportation. Nothing. Brian. Okay. Share center. Rose. Nothing. Okay. Uh, negotiations. Faith or Brian. Yeah, we met, um, gosh, was it two days ago? Anyways, we just met, yeah, and then we'll be meeting with um, 
the whole group on the 16th again okay. to talk face to face. And we will be doing it using social distancing. There's less than 10 of us. And we just thought it would make more of an impact if we met in person than doing a Zoom where we're so. But we're going to be responsible and we have it all spread out so nobody's close. Okay, great. Thank you, Faith. Uh, peer and advisory. No, nothing yet. Probably nothing. Nope. All right. Uh, uh, and I did check technology. All right, ladies and gentlemen, upcoming meetings on June 17th. It's on the agenda that uh, retirement system dropout award recognition will be happening that night. We have a regular and then we'll have a regular meeting following that. Um, any items for uh, f uh, for future agenda items? Oh, just to, because I didn't make note on this, I, um, and I don't know if Brian Carrier has heard, um, we're anticipating city council vote on the school budget on June 15th. So uh, when we get the invitation for that meeting, uh, I'm guessing we'll all be able, you know, those who can be in attendance mm -hmm. um, on the 15th can plan for that. But um, I haven't heard uh, yet officially if that is the date. They do have to do it within 30 days. Can't be more than 30 days. It has to be within the 30 days of the July um, vote. So when we hear more about that, I'll let you know. So if you want to be in attendance, you can. I don't know what they're doing with safe distancing. Are you still limiting it to 10 people in the room? So far, but uh, we're hoping that they'll have made some uh, minor changes. And if not, we've sort of spread out into the hall a little bit on a couple of occasions. So we may have to decide, is it just Karen and I and Adam or, uh, you know, we'll just we can as we get closer to that date, see what the city is allowing. Okay. Hey, All right. Hey, uh, Karen, hey, Katie, yes. can you can you speak to the kind of the, the process that's happening for the uh, the retirement drop out? Like, is, it, is it going to be in person? Yeah, like, is it going to be in person? Where is it? No. You know, or Zoom, or what's the? What's it's going to be. It's going to be all Zoom because you're you haven't you're not meeting yet live. So, um, and it, they bring a lot. Of, they usually how it has been done in the past is it's been at Park Avenue. We set up, you know, um, a celebration. And so we're not going to be able to do that. So what we're, what we're doing is they, everyone has been informed that they'll get the Zoom link. So there'll be a big Zoom meeting at six o'clock where we can have up to 100 participants. So um, we'll, you know, make sure people's families are on and, and so forth. I next week am going to be meeting with the retiree social distancing outside the school so I can take a picture, give them their um, what they get for retirement. And then the system dropout, they're getting their plaques um, at their schools. Uh, and then um, we'll be recognizing them, obviously, online. We're going to do a, the similar thing. I'm going to speak about each retiree. Michelle reads a wonderful book called Drop in the Bucket. She's going to read that. Yes, yes yep. good job of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she's going to do that. And then she's going to say a few words about each of the system dropout. So we still want to recognize and and... Um, for all their great work, and, and then they're being recognized at their buildings as well. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank all, you. All You're right. Um, and I think, uh, Katie, can you just touch upon just one more time? Um, well, and actually, I could do it too. For those of us um, who are planning on attending graduation on um, Saturday, uh, June 6th, Saturday night, please make sure you contact Scott and Air because you will need a parking pass. I clarified that with him uh, earlier. I, w I was a little confused if we were not actually entering, would we still need a parking pass just to be, um, you know, outside um, greeting the graduates as they went in and out. And you do need a parking pass if you're going to participate um, in that. So I will be there. Um, and so if you'd like to join in, you will need to contact Scott for a parking pass. Okay. All right. So again, future agenda items or requests for information, you can either, either Katie or myself know, and we are not entering into executive session tonight. So if everyone's all right with it, I think we can uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Thank you, Brian. Second. Second. Thank you, Dan. All right. All those in favor, see those hands, folks, to adjourn the meeting. All right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Right, thank you. Have a and really good send, night. I will, I will send you all of the graduation information. So if you want to watch online, I will send all that. That hasn't gone out yet. I'm anticipating either tomorrow or Friday um, the link to 
the Facebook Live, the radio channel, everything you'll need so that you can watch it from your home. Um, so you can see the event. It's going to be one for the books. Yeah. So congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Enjoy that night.